beginning in verse 1. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from Acacia Grove, saying, Go and scout the land, that is, the promised land, especially Jericho. So they left, and they came to the house of a woman, a prostitute named Rahab, and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they came to investigate the entire land. The woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, yes, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. At nightfall, when the gate was about to close, the men went out, and I don't know where they were going. Chase after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them among the stalks of flax that she had arranged on the roof. The men pursued them, though, along the road to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as they left to to pursue them, the gate was shut. Before the men fell asleep, Rahab went up on the roof and said to them, I know the Lord has given you this land and the dread of you has fallen on us and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, We lost heart, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my family because I showed kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them and save us from death. The men answered her, We will give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window since she lived on a house that was built into the wall of the city. Go to the hill country so that the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return afterwards go on your way. The men said to her, we We'll be free from this oath you have made us swear, unless when we enter the land you tie this scarlet cord to the window through which you let us down. Bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. If anyone goes out the doors of your house, his blood will be on his own head, and we will be innocent. But if anyone with you in the house should be harmed, his blood will be on our heads. And if you report our mission, we are free from the oath. You made us swear. You know, there are certain things you just don't expect to see in certain places, aren't there? I remember years ago, I've been on two mission trips to the continent of Africa or just off the continent of Africa. I remember flying over Africa and seeing a site that I never thought I would see, snow in Africa. You know, we think of Africa to be a very arid continent, and you don't really think of snow, but... Sure enough, we were flying over Mount Kilimanjaro, and at that particular time of year, we saw the snow-capped mountains. I also remember when I was in high school, it must have been in the early 1980s, and we received snow on October 10th. I can't remember having a snow earlier than that. I remember the excitement of changing classes, and we had sort of a concourse area in the middle of our Uh, school there and I can remember coming out and seeing it snow that early in the year. Now we had a lot of snow last Sunday uh, and Saturday night into Sunday Uh, but October 10th is early. They're just things we don't expect to see. You know as we're reading Joshua chapter 2 we think well this is years before Jesus. Could we even find anything about Jesus in this? And many people would say no, but the fact of the matter is Jesus is all over what we're reading here in Joshua chapter 2. I want to just briefly go through what had happened, and then I want to look at this and see how this story relates to our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. But in Joshua chapter 2, God's people were preparing to go in to the promised land. Now remember, this was the second time they attempted to do it. God's desire was when they came out of Egypt, when God worked the miracle of parting the Red Sea, his desire was that they immediately go into the land 
and take the land, but we remember that that generation of people did not believe God, and except for uh, Joshua uh, and Caleb, uh, none of the other of that generation were able to go into the land. Now, Moses was able to look into the land, and he was a righteous man, but we know that that generation of people died in the wilderness. But we see here right around 40 years after that the opportunity is there again. And so we see that Joshua sends two spies into Jericho. Now, he secretly sent them from Acacia Grove, which was east of the Jordan River. They would have to cross the Jordan River actually to go into the promised land. And he sent these two spies into the land. And Rahab, a prostitute and a non-Jew, receives them into her home, protects them, does not shoot straight with the king of Jericho, but is used in God's hands here to protect his people. Now, in return for her kindness, once she deceives the king's men, she asks for the men of God to show her and her family favor that when the rest of the Jews would come into the land, and we see faith all through this chapter, uh, the spies saying, when we come back, and she's saying, when you come into the land, they knew what was going to happen. And she said, when you come into the land, and when you overthrow this city, please remember me and remember my family. And they went into an agreement with her. They said we would keep that promise, but there were really two conditions. One, Rahab and her family would come into her house. And then she would tie a scarlet ribbon or hang a scarlet thread from her window. Now, obviously, there was a third condition. She couldn't go back and, and um, give them away. Uh, but you understand what, he, what they were telling her there. And so she entered into that particular covenant. And so then, how does this story, though, relate to Christmas? How, how can something that happened so many years before Jesus relate to him? You might be surprised. In fact, all of this book points to Jesus. The law points to Jesus. The prophets point to Jesus. Even after Jesus' life, they all looked back to Jesus in the writings after he died. You may not realize this, but Rahab is a part of Jesus' genealogy. We studied King David back a few weeks ago and the promise that God made to King David that he would have a rule, unlike Saul, who was his predecessor. Uh, Saul's family line was broken and his rule was not forever, but God told David that he would have a line forever and Jesus fulfilled that. Now Rahab came before David. And we read about Rahab in Jesus' uh, genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And we realize that Rahab is or was David's great, great grandmother. And so as we look at it here, she was going to face certain death, but by the sovereign hand of God, two spies came to her house she entered an agreement with them, and through that agreement, by her faith and through her action, she was saved from death. Now, we'll read later in Joshua chapter 6, before we close today, how not only did they save her, but when they saved her and her family, she was brought into the land to live among the Jews. What a blessing it was. Not only saved, but she was brought in among the Jews, and from that we see that she was able to be a part of uh, Jesus' uh, genealogy there, one of only a few women listed in Jesus' line. But today I want to look more deeply into this event and how we see an early picture of Jesus Christ. If you've been with us since November, we've been focusing on the prophecies and the foreshadowings of Jesus. Most recently we've been looking at the prophecies of Jesus first coming. We've noted the prophecies related to where he would be born in Micah chapter 5 in Bethlehem of Ephrathah. We looked at to whom he would be born in our Sunday school lessons as it says that he would be born to a virgin, how he would be born and why he would come to save his people 
from their sins. But while we've been looking at prophecy, don't forget this other thing that is sort of running parallel in the Old Testament, the foreshadowing. And we've talked about the difference in prophecy and foreshadowing. A prophecy verbally articulates the truth, in this case, that Jesus was going to come again. I mean, was going to come for the first time and come again. A lot of the prophecies spoke of that. But a foreshadowing really speaks without words. It's a picture, it's an event that is an early picture of what God was going to do through Jesus Christ. And so as we look at that term foreshadowing, sort of a refresher for those who have been here before, it comes before, thus the prefix for. Shadow is not the substance of something, but it is really a, a picture of something, just as if the sun were to be behind me and you were to stand uh, right there about 10 feet in front of me, and my shadow would come between me, the reality, the substance, and you. And so in this Old Testament account, we see a picture that is not Christ, but it really points and shows that Christ is coming. And, and as we said, in contrast to prophecy, foreshadowing speaks without words. Speaks without words. Well, I want to look at Rahab's experience and how it relates to the coming of Jesus Christ. And first, I want you to note with me Rahab's worth. She was of great value to God. Now, this is significant because what we see here is really a microcosm of what God was going to do in the future. A small picture, a smaller deliverance of what would be a greater uh, deliverance that would come later. Now, Rahab was not a Jew. We know that. She was in the land. She understood Jewish history. She knew what God had done among the Jews. She believed God. We see that. But she was not physically a Jew. She was not well-respected in Jericho. She was a prostitute. And the spies here were visiting her home, not for the reason that many may have visited her home. I, I began to wonder, why did they visit the home of a prostitute? Well, it, it may have been for protective measures. If you think uh, probably if she were a prostitute, especially if she operated out of her home, a lot of times it would not be unusual to see male traffic coming and going. And so it wouldn't be like somebody that wouldn't, you wouldn't expect to have traffic coming and going. And so it may have been that in a clandestine way they were moving uh, through and to toward her home because no one would think it unusual because so many different people would travel there. It may have been that they traveled to her home because it's very interesting. Her house was built into the wall of the city. And so it would be very easy for them to escape. And, and I don't know how I would love to see a picture of that, a house built into the wall, but once they climbed out of that window, they were free uh, from the midst of the city. But, you know, as we think about it, we might have speculation as to why they went there, but it was God's sovereign will that they go into this woman's home because God had a plan for her. And God has a plan for you and for me. And a lot of times we may be like Rahab. She had heard about God. She knew about God's people, but she was just living her life. And then all of a sudden, God visited her through these two individuals. God was going to work in her life. And, and so we see here that God was going to do that. Now, this event, as I'm reading it, probably reminds you of an event that was earlier in the Bible the exodus. Remember, right before the exodus, the death of the firstborn, the plague. And if you've read it in the Bible, hopefully you've read it in the Bible, or if you've seen Cecil D. DeMille, B. DeMille's uh, depiction of that, you understand where I'm going of the death of the firstborn. God made a distinction for the Jews and the Jews who were believing if they would kill that lamb in place the blood along the doorway, then the judgment of God would not come upon those individuals. God would pass over and spare. Here we see a different type of Passover. There wasn't blood placed on the door, but there was scarlet 
there was red that was placed along the window. And so in the same way and in the same spirit of those who were spared the death of the firstborn in the days of Moses, so Rahab, in a smaller way with her family, when judgment came and the people came into the land, would not lose her life nor would her family as long as they were in the house with the scarlet thread. And so we see the similarities. It's not coincidence, but there's a major difference in the Passover and Rahab's situation, and it was this. In the Passover, believing Jews were spared. Here in Rahab's case, a believing non-Jew, along with her family, is spared. And I believe it's a foreshadowing of a greater deliverance that Jesus Christ, a greater deliverance and deliverer to come, Jesus Christ. Jesus came to save people of all people groups. When we watch these videos and we see all of the pictures of the world, we ought to have a heart for all of these people in the same way that Lottie Moon had. In Luke 2.10, the angel proclaims, I proclaim to you good news of great joy for all people, for all people. That's why we support international missions. Every person of every nation matters to God. And we see a picture of that, a foreshadowing of that, as God was extending his mercy and grace to Rahab and her family. But I want you to see a second thing. Not only Rahab's worth to God, but Rahab's faith. Rahab had heard of Israel's exploits. She did her homework. She was a history buff, specifically Jewish history. In fact, she said, we all know what God has done. She knew it was not the people of Israel, but it was the Lord. That's what she depicted and expressed in verse 10, who worked on Israel's behalf. She knew history from 40 years earlier, how God had parted the Red Sea. She knew in the recent past how God had delivered uh, Israel from the hands of Sihon and Og, the kings to the south and the east of the land in which she lived. She understood who God was. And her faith in God led to action. And we see two things, two ways that she acted here. First, she hid the spies. Why did she hide these spies? Because she believed in the God of the spies. She feared God. She understood God would be a God who would judge her if she did not align herself with him. And so when she received those spies and when she defended and protected those spies, when the king of Jericho came, it was an act of faith. She believed that God was who God is. And so she acted to protect. She desired God's favor. Do you desire God's favor today or are you just living your life however you want? Rahab hid the spies. But I want you to see, secondly, she obeyed and placed the red strand outside of her window. She obeyed. Her faith was accompanied by action. And this is really an early picture what we see in Jesus' day. When Jesus came to earth the first time, it was filled with people of faith. They acted. The wise men traveled a great distance. They acted. They did something because they believed. The shepherds, they came because they believed. We studied Joseph this week. Some uh, of us tied in to last week's lesson. Joseph went ahead and took Mary to, to be his wife, to consummate that relationship because he believed, he acted. And so we see throughout, just like Rahab, their belief led to an action. What about you? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? What are you doing to express that faith? Let me suggest really two things. Profess him before others. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. 
if we sit there quietly and we don't profess Jesus Christ as Lord, how deep is our faith? You see, faith is accompanied by action. Another way that you might express that faith in action is by being baptized. Baptism is a witness to one's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Philippian jailer, he believed and he was baptized. And so you say, well, what is baptism? Well, baptism, if you never preach a word, you'll preach through the action, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that faith leads to action. That happened in Rahab's case. And for those of us who live after the life of Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we too are to act on our faith. But I want you to see a final thing, and that's Rahab's salvation. Look at Joshua chapter 6. They came into the land after crossing the Jordan. God parted the Jordan, even as he parted the Red Sea. And in chapter 6, verse 22, they came to Jericho. Joshua said to the two men who had scouted the land, Go to the prostitute's house and bring the woman out of there and all who are left with her, just as you promised her. So the young men who, uh, verse 23, who had scouted, went in and brought out Rahab and her father, mother, brothers, and all who belonged to her. And that's understood that she had fulfilled the conditions of the covenant. Her family was in the house. She had not compromised and changed direction and exposed the work of the spies. She had the scarlet cord. Um, and so they went in. They brought her and her whole family, settled them outside the camp of Israel, they burned up the city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, her father's household, and all belonged, who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent to spy on Jericho. And she lives in Israel to this day. Lives in Israel to this day, to the time of the writing. God saved Rahab in her family. God saw that scarlet ribbon and he spared her. He judged all of the rest of the city. He took out the treasure. But I want you to see that she and her family were a treasure to God. Not to be extinguished in judgment, but to be brought in. One who was formerly not of the people of God brought in to the people of God. And God saw that scarlet ribbon. And I believe symbolically, just as we look back to the Passover, God saw the blood, God saw the red. It's a picture of Jesus Christ, a greater deliverance that was going to come, not just for Jews only, but as was told by the angel when Jesus was born, good news of great joy for all people. I wonder today, have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you believed on him? What evidence is there that you have believed on him? There was no doubt that Rahab believed in Almighty God. She could tell you who he was, what he did, when she was put to the test, she obeyed and she acted on her faith. Are you acting on your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today? Have you trusted him? Have you publicly professed him? Have you followed him in believer's baptism? I wonder today upon what or whom are you depending? I pray that it's on Jesus Christ. You see, inactivity is a problem. Inactivity is a problem. A lot of people say, well, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, I didn't, I'm not as bad as that person. Do you realize the issue here for Rahab was one of activity? If she had been inactive, if she had not obeyed, if she had not done what God had told her to do through these spies, she would have faced judgment just as the others. The others, what sent them into that judgment was their sin, their disregard for God and inactivity. Today, God's calling you as Rahab did. To act in faith, to act in faith on the Lord Jesus Christ who came to die. 
We understand the Passover and how the firstborn were protected in the realm of the home of that blood. We understand today how Rahab and her family, even though they were not Jews, were protected when they were in the realm, in the domain of that scarlet ribbon. And the Bible says those who are in Christ are saved. I wonder today, are you in Christ? Have you acted in faith and made him Lord of your life? There's no more important decision that you could make in your life because it's a decision with eternal ramifications. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why did Jesus have to come to this earth? Because we are sinners. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. We're sinners in what we do and what we don't do. All right? We have fallen short. And the Bible says the wages of that sin is death. There are consequences. Not just physical death, but the book of Revelation speaks of an eternal death, a second death. But Jesus Christ came as our substitute to die for our sins. He placed his life on the cross for you. And if you will trust him and act in faith, even as Rahab did, act in faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, profess him, obey the gospel of God, and follow him with your life, the Bible says you'll be saved. But you first must admit you need him. When these spies came into the land, Rahab knew, I'm part of a group. We're not right. I'm not right. I believe in God. I want to come under the protection of God. You can come under the protection of God today by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father.